Hi, this is Laura. Hi everybody, I am Ava from Detroit Audubon. I am Detroit Audubon's research coordinator and I am here with Michelle Serian from Wayne State University um, and we will be talking about native plants for birds. Um, we're very excited about this topic. Both of us really love talking about it. Um, so we'll go through everything and then we'll have uh, some time at the end to go over any questions that you guys put in the chat um so we'll go over all those we'll also have an information handout um that we will email to you guys along with the um recording that we will we're recording right now um and we'll send that out so you can share it with whoever you want um we'll have all of that information down on paper for you guys available too um and I think that is everything. So yeah, put any questions or comments in the chat while we're going through and we will get started. So Rochelle, if you wanna to click to the next um, slide. Hi everyone, sorry about the delay. I've been dealing with some of the technology here at this end. Um, so I'm a native plant enthusiast and a bird watcher and marrying those two loves together for me was a big deal. I used to have a big half acre lot in Roseville. I saw over 77 species of birds um, in the 20 years I was there. And it was because of the way I had it planted. So native plants are really important for these organisms because they've co-evolved over time. Um, and it's really important to know what a native plant is. So we're gonna start out with that. Uh, these are pictures from my old backyard, by the way. I now live in Detroit, so I don't have that anymore. Oh, and it's stuck. Oh, gotta love technology, come on. There we go. Um, to find out more about native plants, this is a really good site, the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Um, one of the resources they have on their resource tab, which is right here, is the 1800. Michigan was surveyed in the early 1800s, and the surveyors would write down everything in one mile squares, um, the vegetation that was there, what it looked like, what the geography was like so that they would know where to go back and do things like lumbering or where they could put farms. But they made such detailed notes that the Michigan Natural Features Inventory folks were able to take that information and compile it for every county in Michigan so that you can see habitat maps of what the area used to look like. That doesn't mean we can duplicate it now or we can plant the exact same plants there anymore. Here in Detroit, it used to be a wetland. I can't really put wetland plants in my backyard anymore because I'm on city fill and it's just not appropriate. But you can get a really good idea of what is endemic to your region in terms of the climate and the native soils. Um, so that's a good place to start. They also list the natural communities up to see what kinds of plants go together with one another. So it's a really great feature. All right. Go ahead, Ava. Okay. I'm just waiting for the next slide to show up. So right now, a lot of the plants that we have in our yards are um, mostly European and Asian plants. Um, there's a couple of uh, native plants from 
our, our Midwest region um, that, that are kind of more common to see in people's yards. Um, I think a decent example is uh, black-eyed Susans, which is a type of rutabecchia. It's a yellow flower with a black center. Um, and a lot of people have those and because they're very beautiful and very showy. Um, and those are a native plant, but they're one of the more common, one of the more, one of the only um, native plants that we really see in people's yards. Um, like it says here, about 80% of the plants that we have in our yards um, are non-native. And because the birds and bugs in our area have not evolved with these plants, um, they cannot use these plants um, as much as they would use other plants that they have evolved with, the native plants. Next slide. Um, so here, uh, Michelle, if you can click through all of the little um, parts of a ecosystem will show up. Um, so we have the overstory um, and I think the understory should be popping up. Uh, Midstory, understory, and ground. Um, so this is kind of the, the general um, scope of a habitat, and this is what we want to think about when we are choosing what we put in our yards. Um, some of the larger trees, like oak trees, um, smaller trees, like maybe some of the berry varieties. Um, the understory on the ground is where a lot of those um, herbaceous plants are, so a lot of the pretty looking flowers that we like to have. Um, and then on the ground, and, and when I think about ground, I think about um, kind of the, the leaf litter and all of that, um, that, that makeup of the, the soil and the leaves falling and decomposing and adding to that soil and adding nutrients. And also those leaves on the ground or mulch or wherever, whatever you have um, are a habitat within themselves and a really important part um, of where birds find their food. Next slide. Um, so we're going to go through the four main um, food groups for birds. Um, we have insects, berries and fruits, nectar, and nuts and seeds. Um, this is just a good way of kind of breaking things up and, and thinking about um, what different birds need and how much they need of it. Um, so the first one we'll start with is insects and Michelle will tell us, oh wait, no, I'm going to. <laughs> Tell us about how important insects are. Um, so birds eat a lot of bugs and they go through a lot of bugs, especially in the spring and summer because 99% uh, of the passerine species or the kind of the, the little bird species that we have in our areas, um, they feed their babies only bugs. Um, and they need to feed their babies that because there's very specific um, vitamins and nutrients and the amount of protein that's found in bugs um, are all essential for these babies to live. It's a very specific set of um, nutrients and like I said, the really high protein that the babies need to survive. If they don't get those nutrients, um, they, will not, they will not have the proper um, healthy feathers and the healthy muscle development. Um, so getting all of these bugs is really important. There's nothing that can replace these bugs. Um, and then people love quoting this um, example of how many um, caterpillars that a bird has to feed its babies. Um, so it, it ends up at around 9,000 caterpillars for one little nest of birds. Um, and that's just for little chickadees. And chickadees are a lot smaller than many other birds. Um, so they're really going through a lot of these little caterpillars. Um, and when we think of caterpillars, a lot of times we're thinking about like big monarch or swallowtail caterpillars, the ones that are black and yellow with the stripes. Um, but there's little bitty caterpillars all over the place. And those are some of the guys that we find um, on the trees and on the flowers and in that leaf litter as well. Um, so they're not all giant caterpillars. All of those, the large ones and the teeny tiny bugs, all of those are really important and all of those are needed for birds to be able to raise their babies and especially be raising those babies healthy. Um, next slide. 
Um, and like we've, we've already kind of touched on, um, this, all these plants and these insects have evolved together. Um, so there's um, something called a larval host. Um, so many butterflies and moths, they, they have a specific plant that larvae or the babies eat as they're growing up. Um, and so they require that plant for the baby, for the little caterpillars um, to eat those in order to turn into butterflies. So these specific plants are really important for specific species of bugs. They can't survive without that species of plants. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> um, and this is just highlighting that the plants are the bugs need specific plants in order to live and the birds need the bugs to live. Um, so I know a lot of us are worried about um, bugs eating our plants and bugs in our lawn and bugs biting us and we're itchy from mosquitoes and all of that. But these, these bugs are the only ways that the birds can survive. They 100% need these bugs in order to feed their babies and reproduce. Um, there is no other option. So without bugs, we won't have birds and that's just how it goes. Um, so to support bugs, uh, we really need these native species of plants. Um, so we just have one example here. Um, this is, I don't know when, when this kind of mini study was done, what type of oak tree it was, um, but there was over 550 um, species of caterpillar found on just one oak tree. Um, and then over here on the ginkgo tree, and the ginkgo is not a native plant. I don't know if it's from Europe or Asia, but it is yeah. not, uh, thank you. <laughs> it's not an American plant. Um, and that only had five species of caterpillar on it. So it really doesn't support the bugs that we have here. So that shows how important these native plants are. Next slide. Um, so here's a quick list um, and we will, this was some of the information that we'll send out to everybody. Um, and this is just kind of showing some of the very best trees for supporting all these little caterpillars. Um, so like we have the oak is one of the best ones. Um, willow, cherry, birch, crabapple, maple, hickory, they're all kind of familiar species and there are some of these, there are different types of oaks and maples and there are native and not native types. Um, but with these trees generally and leaning towards the native varieties, those are really strong ways that we can help birds and help them provide food for their babies in the spring and summer. Next slide. Uh, and then back to this point about natural mulch. Um, all of the leaves that fall off of the trees are, are part of the, the food chain and the natural restoration process that plants and, and forests go through. These leaves slowly decompose and they're eaten by bugs and worms and other things and they provide nutrients back into the soil. Um, and there's many, many bugs that lay their eggs in these leaves that have um, little larvae or little cocoons in the leaves. And those are really, really important food sources for the birds in the fall and winter. So especially in the middle of winter when it's really hard for birds to find food and then also in the fall when birds are migrating through and they really need that like rich protein source um, to, to power those long distance flights. Um, so I know that we love raking up our leaves and putting them in bags, um, but I, I've worked with in my yard trying to hide the leaves under other plants. So I just like put them under bushes or put them under a big tree or something. And some of them still do go out to the road, but whatever you can do to, to leave more leaves on the ground, it's better for the environment and it's much better for the birds. And it's also very fun when you see um, the birds like kicking the leaves around. It's really cute when you see a robin and it like throws the leaves behind it. Um, I love watching that in the fall, so. That's, that's a treat. If you leave your leaves, you get to see those cute little bird behaviors. So next slide. All right, so we have other food sources besides insects. Um, and insects are pretty good for most birds through the warm season. Woodpeckers, chickadees, and a few other birds 
can find insects where they're hiding through the winter under the bark of trees and in plant stems. But the rest of the time, when they're not feeding their babies, the adults often eat other things. Um, cedar waxwings are 90% of their diet is fruit. Um, robins and thrushes, bluebirds also are fruit eaters, and other birds will um, sometimes use fruit when it's available. And one of my favorites, and this is what we're going to highlight today, are some of the chief things for each of these um, food areas. There are many plants that satisfy this. We're going to send out a handout afterward that's got some of my favorite natives on it. They're relatively easy to grow and look nice in um, small suburban and urban backyards. Um, so this is my A number one favorite berry plant. This is a service berry, also known as a June berry, shad bush, shad blow, has a lot of wonderful names. Amelanchier is the scientific name. And when you go to things in nurseries, it's best to have um, sometimes the scientific names because the common names can be for more than one type of plant. So this little tree is an understory tree in our Michigan forests. It has white flowers in the spring before the leaves come out. Um, I think it looks like popcorn when I drive by it. And then um, the leaves come out and in June, you will eventually have these little berries that are purple when they're ripe. Um, they are delicious if you actually had a chance to have any because the birds and the other animals will be all over it. So um, if you get a chance to harvest some for yourself, go ahead, but the birds love them. So they will disappear very quickly. It's a small tree, so it's good for backyards and it can go anywhere from full sun to partial shade. It just can't tolerate deep shade. Um, and then in the fall, the colors are beautiful, ranging anywhere from uh, a deep gold to purple, depending on how much sun the plant has been in during the rest of the year. So this is my A number one, and it's just a pretty tree. Um, on the shrub side, there are several species of elderberry that are native. There are also other shrubs like viburnums, spicebush, and winterberry. Um, for elderberry, you don't have to have a male and a female. For others, you do. So this is a fairly easy plant to grow. It dies all the way back in the winter time. So you won't have any stems or leaves up during winter. There'll be nothing there, but it will come back the next year. Uh, this is good for late summer. And then there are other shrubs that will have berries into the fall. When you're planning your garden, it's good to have a plan so that you've got plants that provide these food sources throughout the season as much as possible. So you'll have kind of late spring, early summer, um, berries, midsummer berries, late summer and into fall. And you want to do that because we have four groups of birds that are here for us. We've got winter residents, so they'll need food in the winter. And some of those are here all year, but then we have juncos that just come down for the winter. We have migratory birds in the spring. So they'll be looking for food sources as they fly north to their breeding grounds. And some of them will stick around here. Those that do stay here are our breeding residents in the summer. Those are the ones that are going to the most. But they'll also need food for themselves as adults. And then we have fall migration where the birds really need a lot of uh, protein and fats so that they can make the long journeys that they have to in the fall. So try and plan those things out in your garden. You get to see all the colors of the flowers through the seasons and then the birds get their food through the seasons too. All right, so um, moving on to nectar. Our only nectar drinking bird for the most part is the hummingbird, though there are other birds like Orioles that will go after nectar sometimes. And everybody always associates red flowers with hummingbirds, and that's mostly true. So red tubular flowers, very attractive to birds um, because they can see the color red, and that long bill on the hummingbird can penetrate down into the base of the flower where the nectar is. But if you plant for hummingbirds, you'll also be planting for a number of really cool insects. So bumblebees will make use of many of those flowers and the hummingbird clearing moth, which you see there below the hummingbird, will use a lot of the same plants that hummingbirds do. Uh, hummingbirds are back up now. They've been arriving since May. So you wanna plant things in the early spring like wild columbine, which we'll see in just a little while. Uh, wild bergamot is a summer plant and it's not red, but hummingbirds will still use it. And so will hummingbird clearing moths. Um, Another really good plant that's not red is the great blue lobelia. This will take a variety of conditions all the way from full sun to partial shade and from relatively dry to pretty moist. 
So it's a really good all around plant and not as cranky as cardinal flower, which everybody recommends for hummingbirds, but doesn't grow real well in most backyards. This is its cousin, the great blue lobelia, and that's a much better choice for most backyards. Um, so moving on to seeds and nuts. Um, seeds are after the flower has done its thing and you've seen all the pretty colors, you have to leave it around so it produces seeds. And that takes a while for some of these plants. Um, we'll also talk about nuts. Of course, everybody knows about coneflowers producing seeds. This is purple coneflower, but there are many different varieties of coneflower, most of them with yellow flowers. The purple coneflower may or may not be native to Michigan. They're not entirely sure. There is a pale purple coneflower that is the native variety. Um, and then the rutabecchias are your black-eyed Susans, orange coneflowers, and brown-eyed Susans. Most of the varieties that you will find of both of these plants at the store are not necessarily native. They may be what we call nativars, cultivars of our native plants that are grown in places like North Carolina and Oregon and Washington, and then shipped here from those areas. While they may be native species and endemic to North America, they may not be native to this region and may not fare as well in our climate as they would in the place that they were grown. So it's really important to check those out as much as possible to see if you can get native, truly native plants that are from the Midwest region, as opposed to those that are native species, but from other regions. So in order for these plants to do what they need to do for the birds, you have to leave the dead parts. So they may not be as attractive as you would like, but it's really attractive to the birds as they're migrating in the fall and then through the winter. Insects will also hide stems so that these plants are important for that purpose as well. So I don't do my fall cleanup at all. I do a kind of a spring cleanup when the birds are done migrating through so that they've gotten the best use of those plants that they can. As far as nuts go, um, if you want them fairly quickly in your yard and you don't want to wait for a tree to produce nuts, the American hazelnut is my A number one choice. Again, like the service berry, it's kind of multifunctional. It's got um, nuts, which again, you will never get to eat because the squirrels and the birds will get them way before you do. It's a very easy to grow shrub. It takes a lot of conditions. It doesn't get super big. It will take trimming very well and it has beautiful fall color. So it's a great all around shrub. And if you have it in the right place in your yard, you don't disturb it much, birds might also nest in it. So it's got that feature as well. And if you do wanna plant nuts, most of our nut producing native plants are trees. Um, and it takes them a long time to grow and actually produce those nuts. So if you're going to have nuts or birds, plan on planting a small tree now and waiting for about 15 to 20 years. It's, it's gonna take a while, especially things like oaks, which are relatively slow growing. But once it's established, it will provide those, um, that food source for birds, but also remember what Ava said about the insects that they support. So you're killing two birds with one stone, but not literally. Um, as I mentioned too, some of these plants have purpose. They also provide and winter shelter for birds. So you can have things like small trees. This hawthorn is ideal because it's a very dense tree and also has thorns all along the branches. So predators aren't as likely to get up there and disturb um, bird nests. White cedar or arborvitae is a very common foundation planting here in Michigan. Um, very dense shrub. So it provides a place for the birds to hide from predators. So when that Cooper's hawk is flying after that little bird, the little bird can go into the tree. Cooper's hawk, not so much. Um, it protects them from the elements and it's especially important in the winter for winter shelter for our birds. Now, as we're talking about these plants, even if it's native to Michigan, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to grow in your yard. You have to take into account the conditions in your yard so what we say in the gardening world is right plant, right place. So you have to look at things like how much light is there during the course of the day? What kind of do you have? Is it sandy? Is it clay? Um, how much moisture does it retain? So these are the kind of things you want to look at when you're planting these um, different things in your yard. So we're going to talk about these and highlight some of the plants that do best in different conditions. Um, if you have a range of conditions, there is a goldenrod or an aster for any kind of condition that you have, guaranteed. Wet and sunny, wet and shady, 
dry and sunny, dry and shady. Um, you just kind of have to determine what you want where and then choose the appropriate plant for that place. But there's always a goldenrod or an aster that will do the trick. And when you get our handout, uh, which they'll send later, um, there's a list of some specific ones for those areas. So asters and goldenrods both bloom in the fall. So they're great for migrating butterflies. Um, and a lot of insect species will use those in the fall when the birds are migrating and need those insects to eat. The asters will also produce seeds and so the goldenrods, they're very tiny. The juncos would eat the seeds in the winter time. So I would usually bend these things down to ground level so they weren't kind of standing up and looking weedy. Um, and then the juncos would get the seeds off of the snow. All right, these plants need at least four to six hours of sun a day. Um, they'll thrive in six to eight hours more. Um, a lot of these plants were prairie plants here in Michigan. And yes, we did have some prairie. We had oak openings and we had other dry grassland area plants. So these are deep rooted typically and um, do very well in bright sunshine. One of the earliest to bloom and produce seeds are the Coreopsis, especially sand Coreopsis. So it's one of the cousins of these plants. Um, sand Coreopsis is short. Plains Coreopsis is a mid-level plant and tall Coreopsis is, well, it's tall. Um, it looks kind of like bamboo. And these are all fairly well-behaved plants that produce seeds that the goldfinches just love. And they'll get up there and peck at those plants and spread those seeds all over for you. So the next year, you'll have little volunteer plants coming up also from seeds that the goldfinches missed. Another family of plants with bright gold flowers that like big daisies are the Scotheums. Um, these are very bold plants, so you have a good space to put them in. Cup plant can be kind of a goliath in your yard. Um, I used to call it Godzilla. It can get eight to nine feet tall, has a very strong stem, and it is called cup plant because that stem clasps, or the leaves clasp the stem and form a little cup where water can um, condense. And insects and birds will use that. Um, the insects will also use the plant for nectar. And then it produces seeds that again, the birds really enjoy. Um, but again, these plants are a little more large, can be somewhat aggressive. So you have to have a big space for these plants. Not only do we use flowering plants, to give seeds to birds, but grasses are a great source of seeds for birds. And this is one of the unsung heroes of as well. Grasses with texture, they look beautiful year round. Um, they're very easy to take care of and they come in various heights. So this is prairie drop seed, which is a relatively short plant um, and produces very small seeds. It looks great as a plant underneath taller plants and then it has great fall color. Um, Indian grass is a taller grass that I really like. It has a great red gold color in the late fall. So don't forget grasses as a seed source as well. Um, one problem area for a lot of people is shade. People go to hostas and pachysandras. Uh, those are not native plants. They don't support much. But there are lots of great woodland plants here in Michigan that would normally be under trees. Most of them come from in the spring. They're called spring ephemerals. They do all their photosynthesis and blooming and everything while the leaves are not on the trees yet. So they get all their nutrients, store it down in the roots, and then they go dormant. So there'll be no leafy part above the ground later in the summer. They beat the summer heat and everything else just by going to sleep underneath the leaf litter. So one that's blooming right now in my backyard is woodland phlox. Uh, this is a great nectar plant for small insects and also produces seeds that the birds will use. It has a full sun cousin called prairie flocks, which is pink, um, but these are our native flocks. There are garden flocks as well that a lot of people have, but that's not native, so this is our native flocks. And when it's not blooming, it's a really pretty ground cover. Another really ground cover that can sustain a wide range of conditions from full sun to um, deep shade dry to moist is the wild geranium. This is not related to the bright red one that people tend to put in their yards. This is our native geranium. Um, and again, this produces nectar and it's 
a good seed source as well and is a nice ground cover. And right now, while the hummingbirds are coming through, this bright red columbine is blooming all over the place. Um, so this is a native source of nectar for hummingbirds when they're in the spring. It also liberally produces seed, which the birds don't tend to eat because then it produces all kinds of little baby columbines all over the place. This one will have foliage that dies back in midsummer, but then the foliage returns later in the summer when it starts cooling off again. Um, some of these shade plants also produce berries. So there's baneberry, Solomon seal, and this one, bunchberry, which is a member of the dogwood family. So most of us are used to dogwoods being shrubs or trees, but this is actually a ground cover dogwood that needs relatively moist soil, somewhat acidic, um, and is a great, beautiful ground cover. You can see those dogwood flowers um, on the one side there, and then it produces berries later in the year that the birds will eat. All right, if you have a moist area or you're planning to put in a rain garden, there are many plants that are suitable for that and for birds. And here we have the bright red cardinal flower, which is also good for the hummingbirds. This one blooms in midsummer. It's a fairly plant though, so you have to have just the right conditions. It's also a short-lived perennial, so it lasts for a few years and then it finally dies back. But if it's found its happy place, if you have the right plant in the right place, it will produce seeds and come back from the seed. A much easier to grow plant that has um, many more uses and is much more robust is the rose or swamp milkweed. Now, despite its name, it doesn't have to be in a swamp. It doesn't even necessarily have to be in a moist area. Uh, if it's kept evenly moist through the season, it can dry out in between. And then it has these beautiful pink flowers in the summer that are obviously used extensively by monarchs, not only as a nectar source, but because it's a milkweed, also as a larval host plant. And then hummingbirds sometimes use it for nectar as well. Um, there are many members of the milkweed family that are good for different areas, dry, moist, shade, and sun uh, as well. Moving on to shrubs that are good for what areas. Uh, red fig dogwood is one of those that again has a lot of functions. So flowers in the late spring, early summer, berries later in the summer and early fall, and then these beautiful red twigs through the winter. So it gives you winter interest. It provides food for the birds and insects, and also is a good shelter plant. Um, a lot of birds will build their nests in this plant. This one can get a little aggressive in a yard, so you have to kind of watch for suckering and it's spreading, but it's a beautiful plant year round. really produce much for birds per se, but it's a great shrub for wet areas and it attracts hosts of insects, small pollinators, butterflies, a whole bunch. So um, some of these plants are kind of interesting in that regard. One of the native plant producers did a talk once and he had a plant called New Jersey tea that he was growing for sale. And he couldn't understand why the hummingbirds were hanging out in the New Jersey teas all the time because they're tiny white flowers. And then they discovered that there's lots of tiny insects on those tiny white flowers and the hummingbirds were eating the tiny insects. So they don't just drink nectar, they also eat insects and that's what they feed their babies as well. So having these kind of plants sustains the birds, even though we don't think about it directly sometimes as a plant for that purpose. Dry areas are some of the most difficult to plant. We have two types of dry areas in Michigan, um, sand and gravel and part of the northern parts of um, Macomb and Oakland County around here. Depending on where you live, you might also have those kinds of conditions. These plants tend to have very deep, extensive root systems, sometimes up to 14 feet, and up to two thirds of the plant is below ground. So those are really super root systems, very extensive. And these plants are also used to forming communities. So you can put them right next to each other and they won't compete with each other. Um, unlike some of our garden plants where you can just put a patch in and all you get is the same plant in that patch, these plants you can plant close together with one another and they'll form this beautiful tapestry and provide a lot of different sources of food for insects and birds. The other type of dry soil we have here in Michigan extensively is clay. And because of these deep extensive root systems, a lot of these plants can survive in clay as well, as long as it's not wet for extended periods. So hoary vervain, Beautiful, 
blue flowers, purple blue flowers, great nectar source, and it's a seed source for birds later in the year. Um, it has a cousin that grows in wet areas called blue vervain. So a lot of times with these plants, you'll see some species of a group that are good for dry areas and some species of a group that are good for wet areas. But hoary vervain is very good for well-drained soil. It doesn't like to have wet feet. It won't sit in water for long periods of time. So if you have an area that collects water or collects snow later in the year, this one won't do well there. Blue vervain will do better. But if you have an area that stays pretty well-drained, hoary vervain is a good plant. And it's not very tall and it plays nice with other plants. One of my favorite sport dry areas is uh, blazing star. There are many species of blazing star that will do well in dry areas, uh, some also wet areas, but these pink candles are just stunning and they are a nectar magnet, especially for butterflies. They also produce seeds that are actually quite large and goldfinches are very fond of those seeds and so are a number of other birds. Um, when it's not blooming, the rest of like kind of wide grassy leaves clustered around a base. So it's not very showy otherwise, and it's often under other plants, but as soon as they start blooming, you can't miss them. And here's the New Jersey tea I was talking about earlier. This is a very small shrub with white flowers, but it's attractive to many small insects and therefore attractive to a lot of the birds that will eat those small insects. All right, Ava, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, yes, so these plants are not only great for birds, um, but they are also very good for the planet as a whole um, and very climate friendly. Um, so these plants, um, especially the larger trees that you can plant, will directly reduce greenhouse gases. Um, and they do, they store carbon and they are much healthier for bird populations and support a much more um, diverse populations of birds by having more native plants. Um, and as well, along with helping the birds, they're helping all of the, um, all of the things before the food chain for birds. So kind of all of the insects and little things and all of the things that, that depend on the birds, like the larger hawks and owls or larger creatures um, that eat these birds, the whole food chain depends on these native plants. So they really are so important and really can make a very large difference for um, some of the urban and suburban wildlife that is still trying to persist where humans have mostly taken over. And next slide. It's a little slow here, sorry. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't want to move. Um, well, I think the next slide is <laughs> uh, about how um, all everything, oh, here we go. Um, oh, the benefits to people, yes. Um, so, so these native plants also are very beneficial to people. Um, we, I'm sure we've all heard about how green spaces um, are, are good for our mental health and good for our physical health. Um, these plants, as long as you plant them in the right area, um, once they are established, they require, require um, very little care and they don't need fertilizer or pesticides. Since they have adapted to this area, they take care of themselves. Um, the only part that you really need to help them along with is kind of the establishment period where they have to fight with all of the um, more invasive weedy plants that we have around. Um, so sometimes they need a little bit of help getting established, but then once they are established, they're incredibly hardy and resilient. And so you don't have to spend time and money um, weeding around those plants right. or applying pesticides yeah. or fertilizers no, or any done. of that. These plants really take care of themselves. Um, so if you use native plants in the right way, um, you can create a really beautiful area around your house that I'm sure all of your community members would appreciate. Um, and then any of the local wildlife really appreciates as well. Um, 
and I think I think that's everything for all about the importance of native plants. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and there we have our uh, contact information. Um, if you guys have any any specific questions, you're always welcome to email us anything about plants or birds, um, any of that. Um, and I think we can go through questions now. Um, let's see, let me pull up the chat and we will go. I can, I can go ahead and read oh, them for okay. you. My Thank name's you. Sarah House and I'm the program coordinator at Detroit Audubon. Um, so the first question we had was, will birds nest in serviceberry trees versus the hazelnut? I have a very sunny and dry location and I'm looking for a smaller tree. Um, it depends on how dense the service berry is. It tends to have fairly slim branches. It can grow as a tree if you trim around on the bottom and remove the extra branches. You can also grow it as a small shrub, so it'll be a little more dense. Um, but it tends to be fairly uh, light stemmed, so it's not very supportive for most nests. Um, hazelnut dirtier bush and would be a little better um, if you want a nesting space for birds. Great. Um, do the relatives of native plants still feed local birds and insects? Yes, but not as well. Um, and there are some relatives that are not very good for native wildlife. Um, we have native mustards, uh, cress, some plants like that that are here in Michigan that support um, our native white butterflies related to the cabbage white that you'll see around your backyards very often. Garlic mustard is a relative of these plants, non-native, invasive as most of you may know. Um, it also attracts the white butterfly, but when they lay their eggs on it, it kills their larva. So some of these relatives of our natives have chemicals in them that our native wildlife is not adapted to um, because they don't want to be eaten in the countries where they come from. So they produce these chemicals to stave off um, the insects mostly in their native environments. Um, those insects have co-evolved with those plants so they have some workarounds sometimes for those toxins, but our native wildlife does not because they haven't co-evolved with these plants. So it's best to stick with as close to native as we can get. Um, the more native, the better. Great. Um, the next question was, around what date do you do your spring cleanup? Um, I usually wait till the end of May, actually. Um, sometimes I'll knock things down so they're not standing up, but I never remove organic material from my yard um, because that's part of the ecological cycle, as Ava had mentioned. Um, those things need to go back into the ground to decompose and return nutrients to the soil. If you think about it, um, that tree that is growing in your backyard is sucking nutrients from the soil to build the leaves and keep the tree growing and functioning through the year. When those leaves fall and you rake them up and take them away, you've removed all those nutrients permanently. So the natural cycle is to have decomposers like bacteria and fungi and insects break those things back down and return all those nutrients to the soil so the cycle can the next year. Um, so I don't remove things. I will knock them down. I will put them in other parts of my yard to tidy up, but I never take them away. Um, sometimes you can't do that in a yard, especially if you've got a lot of coarse woody debris, but do the best you can. Try and keep as much in your yard as you can. Compost it, use it as a mulch but that's the best way to go about it for wildlife. All right. Um, how can you tell when the birds are finished migrating through in spring? There's usually a window. Um, most of our songbird species, so the little passerines like the cedar waxwing you see on this last slide, um, they start migrating and it depends on the weather through the states below us but they'll come up as early as March, some of the, the birds. And then the last ones through are wax wings and they'll be late May to early June. Um, Ava, do you have better information on that? 
Um, a lot of the migration is, does kind of taper off by the end of May. Um, but I do, I mean, the birds are, are, um, always there and always needing food. Um, so it's, it's a little bit tricky to say. Um, but I, I, I like going with the idea of if you, if you do kind of want to knock things down to tidy up that, um, just kind of like me breaking them and putting things on the ground so they just kind of blend in with the ground or the mulch or the leaves or whatever. Um, I, I think that's the best system to use um, that way in case there are any resources left on that plant, um, the birds can still get to them. Okay, then we have some questions about where to purchase native plants and whether it's best to purchase plants or seeds. Um, you can do both. We do have places in Michigan through the Michigan um, Native Plant Producers Association, MNPPA, and we will give you a link to their site um, that produce, that sell seed. Um, Michigan Wildflower Farm actually sells sample packets, so you can try the seed. Um, and if you're interested, we might put together another webinar on growing native plants. Um, the seeds are usually sown in the fall because if you think about it on a native plant, they would fall off um, through the fall and winter and land on the ground and stay there all winter long. Most of them need to go through a freeze thaw cycle in order to germinate in the spring. We can reproduce that somewhat by using our refrigerator or freezer, um, but some of them also need some moisture. So there's special ways to get them um, primed to grow. And then in the spring, they'll come up. So you can either sow them directly in the ground or I put mine in pots and just leave them outside and cover them with wire so the squirrels don't play in them, which is what they're doing in my yard right now. Um, and then let them come up in their own time um, from the fall into the spring. Uh, as far as plants go, there are a few vendors here in Michigan. Um, there's one in Ann Arbor, though I think he's kind of winding his business down a bit. Um, also in the Lansing area, that's our biggest local one. But a lot of local garden groups host native plant sales here in the Metro Detroit, Metro Detroit area. So the St. Clair Shores Yardeners will be doing one soon, uh, North Oakland Web ones. There are a number of groups in the area that bring plants in and sell native plants here locally. Great, thank you. And like we said, we'll be sending out a list of a lot of these resources too. Um, okay, we have some questions about getting rid of invasive species um, without killing native plants. If there's any suggestions or advice on how to do that. That would depend on the species. Garlic mustard is something that right now, this time of year when it's blooming, you can pull. Uh, it comes out fairly easily. You have to bag it up to get rid of it. That should not be composted because even after you pull it, it can still finish out its life cycle and produce seeds. So that one, should, I don't, don't compost that one. Um, more shrubby plants like autumn olive um, can be cut back. If you want to stay as organic as possible, then you have to continually cut back until you exhaust the plant's resources. Um, if you're willing to use a little bit of chemical, if you cut back and just paint the cut stem, with um, an herbicide that tends to knock the plant back also that's best done in the fall so that the herbicide can be taken down to the roots and kill out the whole plant. Um, if it's a big area and you can smother it, you can put down newspaper or cardboard and mulch on top um, several inches and just smother the area out. You can do that for a lawn or other areas where you have a lot of plant that you want to remove. Um, if you're not going to plant anything there for a little while, uh, a light white vinegar solution sometimes works. I do that with plants in the cracks in my sidewalk. Um, if I can't get to the roots and can't pull them out all the way and I don't want them to come back and produce seed. Um, Ava, other, or Sarah, I know some of you have done native or invasive plant removal. Did you have other suggestions? Um, I don't, I don't have too much. Um, I know that there's, there's some information on some of the uh, native plant websites. 
um, that, that sell the seeds. Um, so I use Prairie Moon sometimes, um, and, and they have some good information about um, how, to, how to create an area and how to kind of um, kill off the, the, uh, the previous seed bed and all of the um, invasive seeds that are in there. Um, and, and one tactic that we've used is um, just putting like a tarp over everything and just and cutting that off and leaving that there for a while. Um, sometimes a, a whole year or so um, just to really kill everything that's there um, and, and then plant the new seeds in there. Um, but that's my, that's my best. I usually just go with pulling things out by hand. Um, we have a couple questions about specific plants. Um, does cut plant attract mosquitoes and will the great blue lobelia attract hummingbirds as well as the cardinal flower? Um, I'll answer the second question first. The answer is yes. Great blue lobelia will attract hummingbirds. Um, maybe not as much as the cardinal flower because it's a, not as showy a plant, but planted in masses, it will still bring them in. Uh, we had both when I was working at Lake St. Clair Metro Park Nature Center and um, the hummingbirds did use great blue lobelia. Um, and then the first question, Sarah. Sorry, sorry it was about cut plant, whether it attracts oh, mosquitoes. mosquitoes. No, the water retention of that small cup area is relatively limited. So the mosquitoes can't lay their eggs in that cup of water and have them develop in time into adult. Um, one thing that native plants and other pollinator plants do attract is male mosquitoes. The only one that bites us is the female. Um, male mosquitoes drink nectar. So they're pollinators, just like other small insects. If you plant flowers, you're going to have male mosquitoes, but it's the females that bite us. Okay, then we have a couple questions about attracting specific birds, um, recommendations for attracting orioles, and the cedar waxwing. Uh, cedar waxwings, fruits. So Juneberry will be producing fruit um, before too long here, um, right as the cedar waxwings are coming through Michigan, so it's a good bush to start with. Um, orioles will also eat fruit, um, so will thrushes, robins, and bluebirds. Um, so any fruit producing plant will work for them as well. And then mid-year or mid-summer, um, a lot of berry producing shrubs. Um, and then in the late fall, uh, crab apples and hawthorns have berries that are more persistent. So they'll last later in the season and they're a little harder. Um, they'll also go through the winter sometime. And in the winter time after they've been through a frost, a little sweeter and a little easier to eat. Um, viburnums are also berry producers that have different um, times of the year when they produce berries depending on the species. Highbush cranberry is one that has persistent berries that last through the winter. They taste awful in the fall. I know I've tried them, um, but they're much better after they've been through a cold snap and the birds will use those. One thing with the the viburnums is right now they're suffering from a non-native invasive pest called the viburnum leaf beetle that chews the leaves in June. So that's one thing to keep in mind with some of these plants that they are hosts right now for some non-native pests and our birds typically don't eat those insects much. So um, you kind of want to watch out for that. Dogwoods are another good berry species. And then in the fall during migratory season, um, pokeweed, it's a toxic plant, so we can't eat it. We don't want it around children and pets, but it's a, a really great plant for fall berries. Um, Spicebush is another one, but that requires a male and female shrub. And there's no way to tell that until they bloom. So there's all kinds of different berry producing plants that uh, fruit eating birds like cedar waxwings and orioles will use. Are there any berries that are poisonous to birds? I'm trying to think. Um, not that I'm aware of offhand. They're toxic to humans and other animals often. Um, birds will actually eat poison ivy berries, which is why sometimes along your fence you might get poison ivy growing because birds are the 
um, dispersers of berry seeds. So the plants produce berries to be attractive to animals. The animal eats the berry and inside is the seed. The seed is not digested and comes out with a little package of fertilizer at the other end. That's the whole purpose of a berry, really, or any kind of fruit. Um, so they eat most berries, they eat nightshade. Things that would be toxic to us um, are not toxic to them necessarily. However, we have found that some of the non-native berry producing plants do alter um, some of the bird's biochemistry. I don't remember which plant it was offhand, Ava or Sarah, you may remember, but cedar waxwings, instead of having yellow tips on their feathers, are eating one of the non-native invasive species berries, it might be autumn olive, and it's changing the color of their um, tips on their tail. So instead of being yellow, they're turning orange. I haven't heard of that. That's really interesting. So that's why they to stick with natives. Um, are any of them pervasive and can take over a perennial garden? Yes, some are more rambunctious than others. Cup plant is one of those that can be very aggressive. Um, some of the native sunflowers can be aggressive. And sometimes if your plant finds a happy place, when it may not be as aggressive, if it's just kind of feeling so-so in a happy place, it might spread either by underground rhizomes, um, which is what makes Canada goldenrod spread along the sides of a highway. So that is not a goldenrod you want in your backyard. Um, others will spread by seeds. So when the birds are in there taking the seeds off the plant, um, they're shaking that part of the plant. They don't get all the seeds. And so they may self sow and come up in other places. So um, there are plants that are more aggressive than others. On the handout that you're going to get, um, even though they're some of my favorite plants, they are marked. Common milkweed is another one of those that can be a very aggressive plant. Um, and then there's some questions about if you're new to native gar plant gardening, what are some good plants to start with? And if there's any um, suggestions for planning a garden or design? Um, the plants that we introduced in this slideshow are probably the easiest, among the easiest to grow. Um, cardinal flower is one of the few that's kind of touchy and has to have a pretty specific location. Otherwise, we try to highlight plants that are relatively easy to grow and are fairly widely available. Um, there are some really good native plant resources online and in book form that we'll have links to on the handout. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a question about what's good to plant if you have a lot of clay. Um, prairie plants, actually. So there are grasses, Indian grass, big blue stem, little blue stem that will start to break up the soil and produce a lot of um, organic material that helps keep clay from clumping very much. Um, the silphiums, cup plant, and its cousins prairie duck, compass plant, and rosin weed are pretty good for that. Um, some of the goldenrods, um, I'm using gray goldenrod right now in some areas on campus uh, here at Wayne State. Um, that's pretty good for that. Some of the asters, New England aster will tolerate clay. So there are quite a number of plants. Um, if you go to the Michigan Wildflower Farm site, they actually have a seed mix called clay busters um, or clay tolerant plants. So some of the native plant seed places actually sell mixes specifically for clay. Great. Um, let's see, uh, another question, how has the drastic drop off of insects affected bird populations? Ava, I'm gonna let you take that one. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the drop off in insects is definitely one of the main reasons that we've seen the giant decrease in bird populations. Um, when, when people talk about this, this recent really drastic um, decline in birds since the 1970s, um, a lot of that decline is due to the loss of habitat. I Generally, the scientists say that the, the number one reason for this decline is habitat loss and the bugs that um, need that habitat, that depend on that habitat and that come with the habitat um, are, are 
part of that reason why the birds are dropping off. Um, so with the native plants, we can restore those insect populations and bring back those resources. So even if we can't bring back the habitat perfectly as it was, we can bring back the resources offered by that habitat. And then the birds can still have their food and, and hopefully bring some of those populations back up. If you look at the birds, the different ones that have faced the really drastic um, decline in populations and the birds that have faced a not so drastic decline, um, you'll see that the birds that are really struggling right now are a lot of the birds that depend on the insects. Um, so some of the groups that have actually increased in population are some of the raptors and some of the um, waterfowl. And those birds depend on much different resources. They don't need those little bugs. Um, some waterfowl do, but a lot of them eat cranes and stuff like that. Um, so you can really see the birds that depend on the insects are the ones that have these very steep population declines. Um, what I want to mention at this point too is no matter what size yard you have, even if you don't have a yard and all you have is a porch or an apartment balcony, any plants that you can put in there that can support wildlife will bring them in. Um, I have a friend who's got a very small yard in Detroit and she's done an amazing job with planting natives that are beautiful um, she's got them well arranged, they're dense, and she has many bird species. There's a resting, nesting wren in her backyard, um, a lot of insects. She's been able to raise multiple species of butterflies there. So yes, yeah, Cheryl, I'm calling you out. Um, so it doesn't matter what kind of space you have, every little bit counts. I have teeny little gardens on Wayne State's campus, and my students that I work with planted um, some pussy toes, which attract painted ladies. And the next day, and this was at the corner of Woodward and Warren Avenue, the next day the butterflies were there laying eggs. Uh, we've been able to raise monarch butterflies off of campus from just tiny patches of milkweed. So my rule is if you plant it, they will come. So it doesn't matter how much space you have, please plant for wildlife. Excellent. I, we have a couple more questions, but I know it's hitting seven o'clock. Um, so if we can just, we'll go ahead and ask these and then wrap up. Um, mm -hmm. One was, uh, my rodents have eaten every coneflower and black-eyed Susan I've ever planted as well as the Monarda. What do I do? Um, I used to cut my rose blackberry and raspberry canes and make little cages over them. Um, so once they get established, usually they do a little better. Um, deer like to munch on them too sometimes. If they get a chance to be a little bigger and they get munched on, most plants will produce some chemicals that are distasteful to animals um, and protect themselves that way. Sometimes you just have to kind of switch tactics and plant other things. Sometimes you can plant these things among plants that the uh, wildlife won't eat as much. Um, when I was working at Indian Springs Metro Park, we have trillium all over in the woods there and the deer would eat the trillium down to nothing, except where the trillium were growing with skunk cabbage. Um, I don't recommend necessarily planting skunk cabbage in your yard to protect your plants, but sometimes if you mix them up more and they're not in big patches, that helps dissuade um, some of the wildlife from eating them all into oblivion and um, allows those plants to grow in those communities. Great. Um, the next question, I apologize if I've missed any questions, um, was regarding um, why it's so hard to get native plants this year. Um, is there, do you, do you have any knowledge if there's a greater demand or less supply, of course, with the pandemic? Um, retail days have changed and, right. um, but if, if you had any insight into that. Um, I know in some cases there have been some failures with some of the species. We just got a list back from one of the vendors that we had put out that we were going to, we were looking for certain species for here on campus and there were multiple failures um, of the different species. There are very few vendors here in Michigan. So that's another um, issue and sometimes the vendors are moving more toward restoration projects and larger projects because there's more profit involved in those. 
and it um, fulfills a better, a bigger ecological um, purpose. So, and the availability changes with just what they're available to grow and when. And again, like you mentioned, the pandemic shut things down for the, a lot of the retail. Thank you. Um, the last question was if we could have a lecture on composting for gardens. So that's something that we can definitely add to our list of possible topics. Um, and thank you for your suggestions and thank you, Michelle. There is um, on, um, I just saw recently, um, Keep Growing Detroit is a really great resource. Um, and they're doing a um, kind of a similar webinar series um, they also have a little bit of information about um, kind of different garden designs and patterns. Um, and then they also have their webinars and one of theirs is one on composting. And I know that because I am planning on watching it. Um, so, so yeah, we'll put that in our list of things to do. Um, but in the meantime, you can check out their website and I'm sure it's a really wonderful explanation because they do a great job. Um, they also have native plants um, primarily for rain gardens. Um, through the, and they work in cooperation with other organizations here like Friends of the Rouge to install rain gardens so they grow most of their plants for that purpose but I know that they were selling native plants um, in the late summer and early fall last year and Keep Growing Detroit is right down here in the heart of Detroit. That is all the questions that we have. Good. Great. Um, Thank you everyone. I hope you got the information that you were looking for. <laughs> um, and we will be sending out the, um, our resources. Um, we're gonna send out a page about just general bird friendly um, spaces from our other presentation, just as a resource for you guys. Um, and listed on that one is uh, Michelle's list of native plant um, nurseries and resources. So that's on there. And then we'll also be sending out Michelle's list of her favorite native plants. Um, so that's really nicely organized. She marks which plants are her favorite and she marks which plants go a little bit crazy and take over. Um, and she marks seed, nectar, insects, all of that. So all of that good information is on there. Um, and this will be recorded and sent out as well so that you can share it with your friends if you're interested. Um, and I think that is everything for tonight. Um, thank you guys so much. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.